<laughs> when we took on the ERAP program with the city, uh, we knew we were getting into a very complex program that was going to be a large scale program. And one of the first things that we decided uh, in, part, in partnership with our city partners was that we needed to find a way to automate this process to make it uh, more seamless and hopefully more efficient. So that was based on the scope and size of the program. Um, what we were gonna see helping it, trying to help this program uh, provide easier access uh, for the public um, and help our community agencies as well um, to provide access for those that are truly underserved. Um, we wanted to, uh, part of the, the issue too was since we were still in, in a COVID situation, even though we're getting better, was to keep people from having to come to DSS at all um, to apply. So we envisioned a, a program where, like when you apply for a loan online, you basically can go on to a program and you can fill out an application and you can upload some documents and you can get a loan online. So that's kind of what we envisioned with this program. Um, however, we have learned, you know, as we build out programs, things do not always work smoothly to start. And we definitely have had a rough start uh, with the program. However, we are uh, still here. We are getting applications. We are processing applications. And what you see represented today in terms of the, the size of the panel is all the partners that are at the table trying to help us get to a better place. Um, I'll let Janine do more introduction to that. But what you see here is our partners, not only with the city of Durham, but we have our partners here with CASC, who is the supporting uh, company with the software program. And we have County uh, ISNT, who have been a big part of this as well, too. Um, as we have launched this program, we've hit a lot of speed bumps and, and a lot of challenges and a lot of issues. Uh, the, the metaphor has been used. We've been um, flying the plane as we build it. And I think, unfortunately, we've been using that metaphor a lot over the last year and a half. But this is no different. And like with any rollout of a new program and new software, whether it's ACA, NC Fast, NC Axe, there's, there's always going to be struggles and, and challenges, and we have definitely hit some of those. Uh, one of the first ones being the first day we went live with the application, the URL broke, and we had done a lot of uh, media promotion, and it broke. And I went to the county commissioners that night, apologized to the county commissioners, apologized to the public, um, but we got it fixed, and we got it working. And what's been happening is over the last three weeks as this program has opened up, the, uh, the team has met on a regular and ongoing basis to try to troubleshoot the, the software issues, the technical issues, and the processing issues, and to try to improve uh, the process and the program. And while we've had a lot of glitches and a lot of hiccups, we do have over 2,500 applications in the system. So people have been getting in and, and getting information into us. Granted, there's been some, some challenges and we're having to do a lot of manual uh, work on the back end of, of this. Um, however, we are committed as an agency to do that work. We are working tirelessly, uh, long days, uh, overtime. We are going to be pulling in even more resources now on the county uh, management. Uh, Interim County Manager Claudia Hager has assured us she is reassessing across the county uh, departments, um, across the enterprise to help get us some resources. We have worked with our economic services division to allocate three more resources there and do some additional overtime from other positions to help us on the back end get these applications processed and start to get them out the door. Um, we are going to be, in addition to all of that, looking at additional temps as well. So we're going to be willing to invest and do what we need to do um, to get this to get this money out the door as quickly as we can. Um, again. It's not gonna be uh, uh, turn the switch on and we're, we're clicking on all cylinders tomorrow, but I believe with each week, we're gonna get better and better and we're gonna see things start to move and we're gonna continue to build and improve uh, on this program. Um, we're re we regret some of the, the challenges that we've had, but again, we have a, a team here that's dedicated. Um, I think that I'm really appreciative of the cast folks for joining us here today. They have really been in the trenches with us. They are with every issue that we get, they troubleshoot, they help us try to get it fixed and get us to a better place. We've been working really closely with the nonprofits that are uh, 
acting as exit access points. And we're going to continue to try to build and improve in that area, as well as making the program even more user friendly. And there'll be some discussion about that. Um, so I think with the adding of the resources and where we're headed, we're going to hopefully continue to get uh, to a better place each week and we'll continue to get funds out. We have been authorizing uh, dollars now. So there has been money being spent and get at, getting out on the ERAP. We've been doing it through checks and through um, electronic funds transfer. So we are very appreciative there to County Finance for helping us put that system in place because that will allow us to make mass payments to large landlords and to the energy companies. So we have some good things on the horizon and our commitment going forward is to continue to build and improve on this program and get these dollars out to the folks in need. Um, and that's our commitment uh, to the community. So we, um, we're very, uh, I'm very, very appreciative as director for all the hard work that my team has put in, the city has put in, our, our team members from CASC and IT. I'm really grateful for the hard work they've done. And I think Janine is going to probably give you some statistical information and share a little bit more about the process going forward. So I'll turn it over to Janine. Thank you, Ben. Um, one of the things that we have talked about uh, over the course of time and uh, development of this program is that we really wanted to integrate automation for ease of use, um, as well as a fast turnaround time. And uh, as of today, that um, really hasn't happened. And we recognize that and um, are working uh, to fix those uh, areas that would cause delays. One of the things I also want to say is that your feedback has been a critical part of that. Uh, and every time an issue is brought to us, it is recorded and cataloged and shared so that it can be escalated and addressed. So this is very important feedback for us. Um, we, like Ben said, we have taken over 2,500 applications. At this point, we are having to process them manually, meaning that we are having to go down uh, through the application, contact the client or the landlord or the proxy um, and verify information or obtain information. From that point, right, we're processing that to the point of uh, an award. We have already made awards. We are already making payments. Um, and and that's, that is the ultimate goal is that we're getting payments out, but we want those payments going out faster. So um, it, because that was the goal from the very beginning to, to make this an easy and, and free flowing process so that we can just get money out into the community, that's why we're committed to to add these resources, to make sure that we have adequate training, to make sure that we are refining our product with the help of our developer, Cask, uh, to make sure that um, when, you, when you do an application, it is um, easier, it is easier to use, it is asking the point in questions, and that we can get an, a full and complete application so that we can review and, you know, make an award as quickly as possible. Um, I know our staff, uh, I have several staff here. I have Lee Little, the program manager, and I also have Contessa Sawyer, who is the supervisor of this program. And we also have added a project manager. This is critical, right? I mean, we are, we are dealing with millions of dollars and um, adding a project manager has been uh, a, a strategic move to make sure that we are able to address uh, technical issues and, and process issues, as well as um, the application issues. So um, we are working literally daily with our uh, project managers, as well as our IT team to make sure that every single time we have a, a an obstacle or we have a challenge that we are committing the resources, we are dedicated to escalating issues and that they're being addressed. Hopefully by now, many of you have experienced a different application that was available on May 10th. Um, if you have not, continue to let us know. Um, th this is a very, very important um, to our community. We are dedicated to helping our residents stay in their homes. We know the pressure of the moratorium. Uh, we all feel that coming down on our shoulders and we are um, 
dedicating our time, resources, and energy to make sure that we can get out as much money to as many vulnerable uh, households in our community as we possibly can between today and the 30th. Um, Lee, did you have uh, some additional comments to make? Other, um, just wanted to make sure my mic for phone. Um, other than kind of dittoing the same thing that Ben and Janine, we have noticed some issues. We take ownership of some of the issues and technology issues. But again, it is our charge. It is our commitment to see this project through. Um, we've tried to put as many enhancements in the technology and also in the uh, policies and procedures just to make this a smooth process. Uh, I know it's not 100% where we want it to be, but hopefully with some continuous hard work and I think we have a great team aboard, we'll get those things accomplished. That's all. So um, we, we've got, um, this is Karen Lotto again from the city. We've got a, a question in the chat. Um, before we went there though, I did wonder um, if um, Janine or Lee or someone else wanted to um, just talk a minute about the fixes that have gone in most recently and what is coming up before we then um, open it up um, and start answering, um, you know, uh, questions from from the larger group. Um, I am looking through our panel here because um, we have IT folks on, um, and it would be great for some of our IT folks to kind of chime in on this because um, they are well represented here. And because we work so collaboratively together, uh, obviously they have kept a, um, a log of everything that we have um, enhanced or any defect that we have fixed or had fixed. Uh, and every different nuance uh, that we have had to add to the system or add questions or add attestations, all of those things that have kind of progressed along the way. Um, I'm just wondering if, um, looking through here, David uh, is available to speak. Would David, would you be able to speak to all the um, progress that we've made so far? Uh, Janine, I don't have the list of defects in front of me. Well, can, can you just can you just talk about um, maybe some of the enhancements that we have worked through? Yeah, I mean the the what we've been doing is just trying to make the whole application process more user friendly. We're um, we're now focused working with CAS to use um, guided procedures just to make the whole process more friendly for the citizen. That's really where our focus is right now. Also, I think um, we'll be focused on adding more content to the website, uh, making information more readily available. I think that's where the focus is right now. Great, thank you, David. We obviously uh, want to make this as, as simple and easy as possible. Hopefully what you're going to see uh, moving forward are um, uh, steps along the way that have um, added guidance um, so that when you get to a part that we know has had um, some issues that there may be a pop-up or there may be a, a little question mark that you can uh, hover over. You know, we're, we're really trying to enhance this product so that it is user-friendly. Um, so um, a couple of the questions that I see in the chat really have to do with people who have already applied mm -hmm. and either um, directly or through a proxy and haven't heard anything about their application, don't know if they are missing documents, will they be contacted about missing documents? Um, and if the application was submitted by a proxy, will that contact come through the proxy? So if you could talk, somebody could talk a little bit about how for all the folks who have, um, have applied, if their applications are missing something, what's gonna happen to their application? 
So that was a issue that came up maybe about a week, a uh, week and a half ago, and we did make uh, the team or the IT team aware of the situation that we did have some applications that are uh, and in the beginning, I like to say that we created a system where uh, the applicant can always view where the steps of their application is in progress. Um, but what we found out a little bit later in the program is that the current updates and sometimes it's stalled in the progress stage. So we're now combing through those applications and making sure that uh, the documents that are needed for them to move on to the review stage is actually there. And if there are some missing documents or some application pieces that were not completely corrected, that we also let them know that it will be moved on uh, once that information is uploaded or corrected. So we have been aware of that situation that uh, just sometimes uh, the applicant has not completed all of the answer fields and it is in a progress state. But we do want to make sure we reach out to the applicant and let them know that there are missing something in their application progress. I have a question, Karen. This is Terry Porter Holmes. Do we have a timeline on that of when we are reaching out to the um, applicant? Um, so let me let me add on to that question, Lee. Really, two parts. You indicated that you would be reaching out to people whose applications were incomplete. Could you talk a little bit about how you're reaching out, and in particular, and to whom? In the case that applicants um, um, have proxies and or went through a proxy. And the second question is um, picking up on what Terry just said. Um, what is the time frame that you're seeing for reaching out to people who have applications either that are incomplete or maybe that are, are complete and are waiting for payment or are waiting for review and hopefully payment? You know, what are we looking at in timelines right now? Um, as, as we got the information, so we were provided some information. It is just being filtered through the social workers to actually take a look at those applicants to see what is missing. Unfortunately, um, the screening process of 100% what is actually needed can't be done without a social worker actually looking at the application. So we're actually now trying to screen through that process and emailing the applications to let them know what indeed are they missing or if it's incomplete and they just need to double check their uh, entries to make sure they are correct. Um, we're hopeful that in, within the next week, week and a half, we can get that done. We did, uh, we did take away the time frame of their application being denied uh, because of the issues that we're having. So no application has been uh, rejected or denied because uh, of timing issue on the applicant's part. We understand that that is our part to fix and we have extended that time. So we have not denied any applications for that. If I can, uh, yeah, pair it back um, or, or something back. What you're saying is that you're hoping to reach out to everyone in the next week and a half to let them know um, if things are missing or need to be done, and that the method that you're using is via email. Is that? Yes. And so is it email to the individual or to the proxy or both? It's probably going to be to the applicant that, um, that created the application, yes. Okay. Um, but Again, it will probably be a general email that they needed. We saw some things that were incomplete and that they needed to fix. Okay. Um, I just want to add that what 
some of the methodology is the priorities, right? We set up priorities for how we would um, evaluate applications based on uh, AMI. That was the requirement of treasury. We built that into our policies. So that is also how we have to go through our applicants and make sure that you know, we are prioritizing those applicants who are uh, below 50% of AMI and who haven't received assistance. At this point, we're looking at both those who have and those who have not received assistance to make sure that we are addressing those two priority groups. Um, so at this point, you know, we've gotten through hundreds of applications at this point, uh, but we have 2,500. So if we haven't gotten to you, if we haven't gotten to your client or clients yet, um, we will, we'll, we'll get, we'll get there. Um, it may take us, you know, a week or so, but um, please understand that we have to go through. We are literally touching every single application to make sure it's appropriate to move forward. And if it's not, uh, if it's not complete that we're reaching out. Um, but what we've learned through HOPE is that calling people and having voicemail back and forth is not uh, a, an, uh, an adequate way of communicating. Uh, it's not efficient. Whereas email, people can respond to whenever they want and usually it's a faster response. Can, can we um, ask Liz from CAST to speak? Um, she is part of a, a, a really committed team that's been helping us uh, through each one of these um, challenges that have come up and they've been open and they've been creative. And, um, you know, I, I really want people to understand that we are not just out here alone saying this, but, but that we actually have developers and a team of people um, who are who are with us on in this and making sure that our community has what it needs. Or yeah. um, Liz, before you speak, um, if you're and you're not speaking, can you please mute? We're getting some background noise. I think that might be Lee. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Liz. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I know that the CAST team has been working really, really diligently with DSS, um, you know, the county, city, and all, all, all the nonprofit partners, um, just to make sure that we're doing everything in our power to build for you guys uh, a really critical solution to, you know, automate as much as possible the intake of really complex, um, very governmenty, if you will, kind of requirements around a very um, time sensitive need to make sure that we're distributing, you know, available funding to vulnerable households. Um, so the CAS team has really been dedicated to, um, you know, building out a solution that is reflective of and flexible alongside the changing requirements that, you know, the DECO team has been kind of getting from the federal level, from the state level, from the county level, from the city level. Um, and so um, I'm really pleased with the work that we've been able to do thus far. And I think where we're at right now, um, and a lot of the feedback that I'm seeing kind of in the questions uh, that are coming through in the chat and in our, our daily conversations with the DECO team has really been about optimization and velocity. Right. What can we do to make sure that, you know, the applications that have already been submitted or are currently in progress, you know, have kind of, you know, easy self help, you know, embedded into the application itself um, to support application completion. You know, how can we ensure that we're creating even more enablement collateral on the back end for social workers who do have to go in and review that data, you know, to understand, you know, how they can slice and dice the data to elevate, you know, those folks who are most vulnerable, um, you know, reach out to folks who have submitted their tenant application, but we're just waiting on the landlord side, you know, and really expediting, you know, kind of email blast, so to speak, wherever possible um, to make sure that we're pushing people to either complete their applications, you know, complete their supplemental applications, um, and then enabling caseworkers again with, you know, checklists and whatever else that we can do to achieve velocity so that we can start getting more of these payments out faster. We're extremely cognizant of the moratorium, you know, sort of deadline here at the end of the month. Um, and so, you know, the CAST team over the past 
few weeks and really ramping it up over the past 24 hours or so um, has been very focused on what strategies we can, you know, apply um, in partnership with DECO um, to, to help achieve, you know, those optimization and velocity goals. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here today to hear these questions, to get your feedback, because it's going to help us better understand, you know, where we can do the highest impact effort uh, to continue to support both the residents of the county and the caseworkers supporting you guys. Thank you, Liz. Um, Janine, Ben, if it's okay, I'm just going to turn to some of the questions that we're starting to get in. Sure. Um, so the first question, um, we've already covered a couple in terms of when will people be contacted and how will they be contacted? Um, uh, question, have the ERAP administrators engaged in discussions with Durham County Court Administration, Chief Superior Court Judge, Chief District Court Judge, and Clerk of Court about extending the local eviction moratorium past June 30th if CDC does not extend because of the issues and delays experienced with the ERAP application? I have had some tentative discussions, but that is definitely on our radar as a strategic uh, approach to try to maybe formalize that even more so over the next week. Um, we wanted to get a feel this week how we were lucky, but yes, we, I, I've spoken briefly with the uh, Chief District Court Judge, but um, that's as far as it's gone at this point. But I think strategically that is something we need to definitely take a look at. If we could get an additional 30 days, it would tremendously uh, help us, I think, um, in terms of getting the funds out. So we will definitely take a look at that. And if we, I know we have a few attorneys on here, so we, if we could band together, I think there's strength in numbers there too, so. Thanks, Ben. Um, so next question um, from a certified community health worker who has processed a few dozen applications as a proxy. Um, the, the demographic I work with do not have access to the internet. I have generated email addresses for these individuals. However, my job will be coming to an end this Friday. How can I transfer the client information to a community-based organization to finish the application process for completion? So essentially somebody who is now a proxy but will not be able to serve as a proxy um, shortly, is there any way to transfer them over to somebody else? This, and if this is a question we need to discuss offline, then we can also note this on. Yeah, I think if, if we want to use our partners, uh, we probably need to, to discuss this offline and engage the partners as well. Um, but as far as the system is concerned, I mean, if you want the emails to go to a different address because you won't be the one checking that address, we, we can change that, that email address in the system. But as far as accountability and responsibility is concerned, that's a totally separate issue. Um, thank you. Um, question, since there's a delay in the online process, is it possible to have ap the application completed in person with a social worker? Nope, not at this time. Mm -mm. Our lobbies are not open yet, not open to the public like that yet. And uh, we're not doing paper applications. Uh, and we don't have social workers that are going through like a proxy to complete the application right now. Um, if we see that in, as a need moving forward, um, you know, beyond the applications that we have available now and through our um, partners, you know, we may have to consider the ability to do that. But at this point with, you know, our, you know, our, our facility is still not open the way, you know, some other communities may be. So we don't really have the capacity to do that right now. I would um, I would chime in to um, Aretha that we can get a list out of the community partners and some of those uh, partners are actually taking applications by appointment. Um, so we can get that information out to you um, in the chat so that your um, applicants can reach out to those community partners for possibly an appointment to meet with them. 
And um, and just to, to further uh, build on what Contessa just said, um, there are five organizations that are under contract to actually assist with the application process. And then there, of course, there are, as you've already, as you've already seen in the chat, there are a number of other organizations who are already assisting um, kind of uh, out of their own mission and, and volition. So, and we're, we're extremely grateful for that. But the organizations that the contest is referring to are those that are that are under contract to assist with applications. And that would be a good place to um, send people who may need, um, have, who don't have access to technology and, and um, might need some additional assistance getting their applications done as a result. And so we'll, um, Contessa, are you gonna put that in the chat? Thank you. Um, okay, question. What about the applications that have been deleted from or, or at least no longer visible in the portal? This has happened to two or three of our applications. Are they somewhere in the system and will they be restored or should we restart them? Well, I, I just want to start by saying that we have not deleted a single application. So if, if there's a belief that we've been deleting applications, that is not the case. Um, there may come a time when we have gone through all of the applications and we have to remove the duplicate ones. That may have to happen. Uh, but at this point in time, we have not reached uh, that velocity of knowing how many of the applications we currently have are duplicates um, or triplicates to know that they need to be removed from the system because having multiples in the system is causing some issue with us, some issue with processing. Um, but at this point, we haven't reached that point to be able to delete those out or delete out the ones that are not finished or are actually blank. Um, so um, and Ms. Clark, I would say to you, if you want to reach out offline um, to uh, Ms. Sawyer um, and if you know the names or the application IDs for the applications that you can no longer see, if you want to share those with Ms. Sawyer, she can perhaps, it might be a visibility issue on your end, it might be a, a, an IT issue and, and, and Ms. Sawyer can connect you to um, the, the appropriate resources to resolve. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, um, next question from, uh, from Mr. Woolley, um, Durham can housing team co-chair, we are seeing that there is not broad awareness of the ERAP in the resident networks we work with in the public housing and HUD assisted communities. What new efforts independent of DH, DHA are being prepared to reach these tenants? Um, I will answer partially, um, and it's not independent of DHA, but I can say that we are aware and, and the county, um, my county colleagues can confirm, DHA is preparing and is, is working on an application for all of their tenants who are um, struggling with rent. Um, and so they are, um, they should be as the landlord then reaching out to um, all of those tenants individually to prepare those applications. Um, I can't speak at this point to um, other HUD assisted properties, although I think we're really open to suggestions for ways that we can get information out to the folks that who are not, who should be hearing it, who are not hearing it yet. I, I would agree with what Karen said. Um, we are working directly with um, DHA and the staff at DHA to make sure that they are able to help their tenants and that's that's like all their global tenants um, to to basically apply in mass, if you will, once they have everyone's information um, to be able to apply without any issue. So if, if each complex is not aware that this is happening, um, I, I'm gonna suggest that they reach out to the leadership at DHA uh, because we have been doing, we have been doing trainings. We have been reaching out to them. We've been doing, uh, I mean, I've had 
uh, at this point, three uh, meetings and town halls with landlord associations throughout Durham County. So um, we have taken a, a deliberate and intentional approach of working with landlords who who are in the low to moderate income um, rental properties. So, you know, we are out there, we are committed to contacting people. And if, if you are, if you are recognizing an area that um, might need some, um, some attention and even bringing this to their awareness, um, we, we would sure like that information, you know, sooner rather than later. It would have been great, you know, in two a, months ago. <laughs> yeah, in an answer to a, the next question that we received, um, the community partners have likely spent some of the budget allocated by the city on staffing. Due to the technical issues with the portal, will the city extend additional funding to these agencies to continue to help applicants? What are, when are these ag agencies funded through? Um, so let me, so the city is funding these agencies. Um, they are currently, their contracts run through December of this year, although we anticipate that um, many of them may um, spend down their funds before that date because of the intensity of, of the front end work. Given, you know, lessons learned, given the way that the um, request for proposals was issued and the language that was in it, we cannot add funding to the current contracts that we have. We, are, we, we are, are not within the rules of the city allowed to do that. What we are planning on doing, however, is um, in, the, in the relatively near future, issuing a new request for proposals um, for partners to continue to assist with um, the emergency rental assistance program. Um, and that is actually why those of you who have ideas of, because um, right now the focus of um, the work of the partners really is on helping people fill out applications, um, which is going to continue to be a very important um, um, activity. But if people have some ideas around outreach as well, we are certainly um, very interested in hearing those and, and so an opportunity to, to build that into a, a future procurement that will um, be happening over the summer. Um, And I will add on to that, that one of the reasons why we anticipate um, adding funding or, or putting out a new round of funding for community partners is because we have received additional funding for the emergency rental assistance as both the county and the city. Um, so in addition to the original um, um, in addition to the to the original nine point six million dollars that we've received, we have um, been notified of an additional sixteen million dollars coming from the state and from the federal government. So um, we anticipate this program is going to continue to run for a period of time. Um, with with that, um, I'm going to turn. Um, so Contessa in the um, in the chat put in the names of the current um, community partners, nonprofit partners, for those who are interested um, in that, and we can um, send out that contact information after this meeting. Um, another question about DHA, um, and I think accentuating the fact, um, Janine and company, that we may need to sit down with DHA and, and really make sure we're all clear on communication strategy because. The question is, are you saying that DHA will apply for all residents? The residents have been told that they have to apply individually. Yeah, just understand that I don't know what DHA has told their residents because, you know, that's, that's um, not within my circle of influence. Um, what I am doing is I am working with the leadership of DHA um, to assist them in making the DHA resident applications as easy as possible. Now, keeping in mind, this is not 100% of their residents. These are those residents who were unable to pay uh, and keep up with their rent, their portion of the rent um, due to a COVID-related hardship. So um, just, I just want to be clear that I'm not, I'm not saying what DHA has told their um, residents because that's, um, I, I, I don't know 
what they have told them. My role is to help applicants apply. And in this case, the applicant is uh, DHA leadership. Um, and so what I would, I would also suggest to folks, if you're concerned with DHA, it would be good to, um, again, communicate that directly to DHA as well, that there is a lack of clarity among residents in what they're supposed to be doing. Um, we can definitely convey that message when we speak with DHA, but, but uh, Janina is correct. You know, it's DHA, we don't know what DHA is saying to its, its residents and what residents are hearing. Um, um, okay, uh, next question. Um, I have completed some applications as a proxy over 20 days ago. I was sent emails asking that I resubmit current information because we are now in a different month. I believe that information should be accepted, ba accepted based upon the original date of application, not the date the case manager is assigned to the case. Yeah, I responded to that in the chat. Um, if Charlotte could get in contact with me so I can um, troubleshoot those cases, um, those specific cases, I'll talk offline regarding those cases. Thanks for bringing that um, to our attention, Charlotte. Oh, and there is, um, I was going to okay, say there is a, a response also from um, Ashanti Brown at DHA. Thank you, Ashanti. Um, that speaks to the question we have earlier. We've advised residents that as we stand up our program, they can apply directly. They're launching an internal program to apply on behalf of residents. So as DHA gears up, then they are, you know, they're letting up. I mean, uh, people are always have the, the, uh, the, you know, the choice to apply independently. But what I'm understanding from this, um, from Ms. Brown, is that folks can apply now or they can wait until DHA stands up its landlord program. Contessa, uh, Contessa, you may need to change your setting. I think you may be just putting chat to the panelists and not all the attendees is what it looks like. You might need to change your setting when you do a chat. There's various settings. Because I'm okay. thinking yours is not getting out to the to the entire to, to all the attendees. All right, I'll um, repost my uh, my messages. Thanks, Ben. Okay. No problem. Um, okay, next comment or question: We need our Durham District Court to continue suspension of eviction hearings for rent beyond June 30th. We want everyone who needs help to get rental assistance. When will the new funds be available? Um, so there are currently um, two pots of new funds. Um, the first is um, from the state. Um, I don't know, um, Janine or Ben, whether you have any clarity on timing for those funds. Yeah, so the way I understand it, Janine, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we, um, once we spend down to a certain percentage of this first allocation, that second allocation would be released. So it's gonna be based on when we get this, this I don't know if it's a 75% level, it seems like is what's in my mind, but it might be a little less. But that's that's how I believe that um, those funds will flow down to us once we get to a certain right. level of spending the first yeah. round of allocation that we're, that we're spending right now. But I agree with uh, with um, the rest of there. We Again, it goes back to, I think, some local advocacy to uh, extend it at least 30 days, I think would be beneficial. Um, to us, I believe our, our judges would be open to that. Um, so I think that would be a, a, a collective thing that we should all try to sign on to. Um, and then um, just the, the next round is from the um, American Rescue Plan that came out. So seeing the county have um, received a portion of that funding already with the balance of funding um, contingent upon spending down. Um, Correct. Some of it we have in hand, some of it um, we would need to spend down to get. And, and those funds are a little different as well, too. They're not quite as tied to the COVID, from what I understand, as well, too. So we, um, you know, we're focused right now on just ERAP 1, and then ERAP 2 will follow that and, and how we go about getting those funds out. It may be a different, a different look altogether. So we're just focused on ERAP 1 right now and getting these funds out. And if at all possible, our goal is to not have any interruptions in service, essentially to, to be able to continue to offer the program um, to roll from one funding source to another. Um, 
Okay, question. Um, how does a tenant change the landlord contact information after they've submitted their application? Also, if the landlord does not have an email, will they be contacted by phone to verify themselves for the landlord verification form? Contessa, are you able to provide that level of detail, please? Sure. Um, the applicant can actually go back into the application and edit that information. Um, it would be um, at the landlord's name. They would need to um, enter the landlord's name. And then at that point, they should be able to uh, include the, the um, address, the email address at that time. And if the landlord doesn't have an email address? If the landlord does not have an email address, right now we have the system set up. Um, Liz, I guess if I saw you unmute, I'll let you. I just jumped off mute to help you out. Um, <laughs> so the way that we have the system configured right now to in part verify identity and in part because of the requirements of the program, um, the tenant has to submit an application and the landlord has to submit an application and there's sort of a manual review and compare and contrast process that needs to happen on the back end. So in order for funds to be released to the landlord through the through ERAP one, um, you know, this first kind of um, allocation of funding that we're working through, um, there needs to be a way essentially to contact the landlord to submit their landlord application, you know, one, two, three times in accordance with, you know, treasury procedures and regulations. Um, so we, we will have to have um, either an email address or a phone number for that landlord um, as part of the tenant application. So that's, that's kind of one of those hard requirements based upon, um, you know, just the, the must haves of how this money, you know, has to kind of go through a series of checks and balances in order to be distributed to vulnerable households. And I do want to add on the DSS side, we have um, a landlord tenant, uh, I'm sorry, landlord proxy um, group of social workers that's specifically working with landlords and proxies to identify the, those technical issues or if they need assistance with the registering and that type um, information for the landlord. So those landlords that are, are um, a little, that need a little more assistance with the, um, the software can definitely reach out to that group and they'll be able to walk them through that process. I'll add that information in the chat as well. Thank you, um, Contessa. Um, so a question, um, is there data on the work by community partners such as applications initiated, applications completed, family served, et cetera? So the answer is yes and no. Um, and that is because we have gotten caught up in some of the um, limitations, initial limitations of the system, um, where um, originally the plan was to track um, proxies by email addresses, um, but there wasn't an initially an ability to have both a tenant email address and a proxy email address. So Right now, our um, community partners are keeping lists on the side. We hope in the future to replace that with actual reporting from the system. Um, so yes, with the reporting that the city gets, there will be information um, about applications. It's gonna be a little imperfect until we um, have some system improvements, um, but it's built into the contract um, are some measures around, around service. We're trying to be flexible on them because as as everyone's aware, the rollout wasn't quite what we've expected and the community partners have struggled with the technical issues along with everyone else. And so we have to take that into account when looking at what they've been able to, to do. They've had to work within the system that we have. Um, um, so there is a question, um, Seems to me that after this meeting, we um, there's a question like will this the question about whether the meeting will be posted late later that we need to follow up this meeting with sort of a list of contact information for the the community partners for the landlord um, proxy 
um, address and um, and also where we're going to post this actual um, Zoom recording um, for the folks who, who maybe missed it and want to go back and, and listen. So we will follow up with that. That email will go out to the original email list that we sent out, plus anyone who registered for the meeting today who wasn't on our original list. We just keep adding names to our original list. Um, just looking, um, hang on, um, looking, so there's some individual phone number people looking, um, okay. Oh, it looks like some contestants already put some of this in the chat. You're good, Contessa. Um, and I'm just trying to see if I'm, do folks see questions that I've missed? Oh, there's a question. Did everyone receive the link for this afternoon's meeting from Juliet Black? I think that might just be a question trying to test how people are hearing about the meeting. Um, if you, um, but under, if you weren't on the original distribution list, but you registered for this meeting, we will take your email address and add you to the list for future um, uh, events. Um, and I'm just looking down to see if they're, can a renter complete an application themselves? Their landlord does not know how to submit the, land, the landlord's missing documents. Okay, Larissa, I, I may need you to clarify what you mean here. Are you saying can the, land, can the renter um, complete an application, including the landlord portion? Um, if you wanna put in, um, an answer down below, then we'll circle back to this question. Um, what is, okay, so have an answer to that, the question from the side, we will come back to it when I get a little more clarification. Um, what is the amount of money thus far dispersed through ERAP? How many applications have been approved? These would be helpful stats to build on the 